archaeologist David S. Anderson. Um, he, uh, he, he's got a real bug up his ass about ancient aliens. I'm just going to say that right up front. And I don't blame him because, um, well, he'll go into all the reasons himself, and, and you can see that. But if nothing else, the whole ancient aliens idea did inspire The Eternals by Jack Kirby, soon to be a major motion picture by uh, Marvel Studios, aka Disney. Um, so we got that, um, but um, was it really worth it? I don't know. Uh, so David is going to tell us all about that right now. Mitch, push the button, please. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in to AIPT's Sci-Fi Fest. I am super thrilled to be here. My name is Dr. David S. Anderson. I am an archaeologist. I got my PhD in anthropology, and I currently teach anthropology and archaeology at Radford University. I've got some traditional interests in Maya archaeology and the study of ancient socio-political complexity. Uh, but I'm here to talk about some intersections today, right? Pop culture and archaeology, pop culture in the ancient world. In particular, I am very interested in what I would call pseudo-archaeology, where we get some strange alternative claims about the ancient world that aren't really supported by scientific evidence, but nevertheless are popular out there on the internet and the TVs. And I am particularly interested in how those kind of things overlap with pop culture, which means I am here today to talk about the Eternals. Uh, we got a movie coming out, there's a new comic series, and it's full of ancient world references and full of pseudo archeological references. And so I wanna to talk to you about why that matters and what's going on with all of that. Let's go get to the pretty pictures. So the world's about to meet this comic book franchise, The Eternals, in a big way, right? Those of you in the know, you know this is an older story, this is an older comic, we'll get to that. But so much of the modern pop culture lens has met Marvel characters through the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? And one of the next movies coming out in November is The Eternals, where we're going to meet these characters, these eternal beings. Now, being that this is the MCU, we are almost certainly going to get an origin story out of this uh, film, right? We're going to meet, and we're, what is the origin story? What's going on here? Uh, the Celestials are going to come to Earth and they are going to m manipulate, or at least they should be manipulating life on Earth to create the Eternals, these eternal beings who are going to be mistaken as gods by humans in the future. They are going to create the deviants who are sort of the bad side of the Eternals uh, who are going to be mistaken by devils uh, or mistaken as devils by humans in the future. And then the Celestials are also going to create humans. At least that's how it went in the original comic book. We'll see what they do with the movie. Now, I think this is super significant because in the MCU, we are talking cosmology. We are talking about what is the grand picture? What does the universe look like? What does Earth look like? How are they created? Where do they come from? That is almost certainly what this movie is going to lay out for viewers, uh, particularly because we've already got some threads in prior MCU movies. The Celestials, these ancient beings, these universal beings have already been introduced. Star-Lord's dad is a Celestial, played by Kurt Russell, of course, right? Uh, so we're going to see a little tie there. And the big picture is that, or the really, I think, kicker is that we're going to see probably a tie through to Thanos. Because uh, Thanos, uh, this was kind of, you know, lesser known or harder to find Marvel lore uh, earlier before, you know, the last few years, last year. But Thanos himself is an offspring of the Eternals. And of course, Thanos as the big bad in the Avengers franchise needs an origin story. And so we're probably going to get, maybe not his actual origin story, but we're probably going to get hints and nods at his origin story. And so this Eternals movie is going to tie together that MCU even further and show you where it came from, how it developed. We're going to get a, you know, cosmology. What is the fundamental origins of the MCU laid out for us? Uh, of course, there is also a new comic franchise that's going on right now to go with this, right? We have a new book that started earlier this year, uh, published by Gillen, Ribich, and Wilson. Uh, 
This is interesting that, of course, it's not an origin story. We don't really see the origin stories in written comics as much anymore as like we used to. Uh, the modern comic book is far more focused on strife and battle in between and among the Eternals. Eternals betraying one another. Eternals being uh, actually killed off and murdered. The Deviants have barely showed up in this comic book so far. And so I suspect as much as these are both coming out here in 2021, the Eternals, New Eternals comic book and the New Eternals movie are going to probably be very different. And yet they both fit and hit at that grand cosmology. What is the deep history? What is the origins of everything going on in Marvel's universe? Of course, this is an old story, right? This is not something that is just being picked up and written brand new for the, the movie theaters. This storyline is based specifically on Jack Kirby's The Eternals, which first was published in 1976. Uh, Kirby, of course, King Kirby is one of the grand masterminds behind the resurgence of Marvel Comics in the 1960s. He was partnered with Stan Lee. There's some famous strife between these two individuals in the backdrop, but Lee and Kirby were credited with the vast majority of Marvel's genesis in the 1960s and all the things that they did. Uh, Kirby kind of broke away and came back to Marvel. And when he came back to Marvel, he was given permission to do this storyline, what he had really wanted to write, The Eternals. This was that origin story. And I love the way this book, number one, starts off because it speaks to archaeology, to my roots, where what do you have? Basically, at the beginning of book one of Kirby's Eternals, you have a doddering old archaeology professor uh, who is convinced that there's this like alien spaceport under a, a ruin, an Inca ruin in South America. And so he travels down to South America and finds and he's you know got this weird guy traveling cameraman traveling with him uh, who turns out to be an eternal in disguise uh but they find the the ruins and sure enough underneath those ruins there is actually an a this the spaceport thing and it turns out that this summons the deviants and then the the cameraman reveals himself to be an eternal and there's a battle between the eternals and the deviants and we get this grand cosmology um this story also tells us that origin story about where not only the Devi the Eternals and the Deviants came from, but where human beings, Homo sapiens, you and I actually came from. This story lays out that humanity was created by celestials. It was created by these uh, sort of omnipotent space beings who came here and messed with life that was already existing on uh, Earth to create us. This is grand cosmology sort of stuff. The interesting thing is that this is not the first time that Marvel, that Kirby, that comic books, that pulp fiction had ever played with this idea. In fact, it was a pretty common trope by the time we got to the 60s and the 70s. Uh, the most explicit one that I want, one of the ones that I really like comes out in Fantastic Four number 64 and into number 65. Uh, this is like, you know, almost 10 years earlier than the Eternals. Uh, and we don't know exactly who, or I don't know exactly who wrote this story, but Kirby and Lee are credited up at the top. Uh, and what do we have? We've got the same thing that happened in Eternals number one, nine years later. We have this doddering old archaeology professor who becomes convinced that there's a sort of a space alien port underneath some ruins in South America. And so he travels to South America to try and find those ruins. And sure enough, there's a spaceport underneath those ruins. Uh, and when this time uh, he awakens a sentry robot who awakes to defend that spaceport and the Fantastic Four swoop in and save the day. Uh, so instead of a battle between Deviants and uh, Eternals, you get a battle between the Fantastic Four and this sentry robot when these ruins are uncovered. The next issue, we get a really cool thing that happens in number 65. It is the first appearance of Ronan the Accuser, uh, a Kree judge who comes to Earth to see why on Earth was this sentry robot awakened that was left there by the Kree a long time ago. And we get a very important little bit from Ronan here where Ronan says that the Kree race has so much power that they must, that their technology must seem like magic. 
uh, to the, uh, the Fantastic Four. This is the culmination of a long tradition that starts at least as early as the 1890s uh, of fiction about aliens visiting Earth and aliens being perceived as gods and alien technology being perceived as magic. This is all stuff that's been laid out in comic book after comic book and pulp fiction story after pulp fiction story. So that by the time you get to the 60s and then the 70s when the Eternals comes out, it's kind of a standard trope. But there's a big difference between 1967 Fantastic Four number 64 and what happens nine years later in the Eternals because in 1968, another book came out. That book was the book Chariots of the Gods by this man, Eric Von Doniken. Now, this book claimed it was all real. Basically, Von Doniken says that aliens came to Earth in, the, in our ancient past, that they helped to create human beings. Actually, in this book, he does, he winks and nods and suggests that the space aliens had sex with early proto-humans. Uh, he kind of pulls back from that later and suggests it's some sort of genetic engineering, but he's, he's pretty straightforward about, you know, the aliens picking beautiful women and mating with them in this book. Uh, and then he says that the, you know, these aliens are going to be perceived as gods, that they're described as gods in humanity's ancient religions. And he says that their technology was viewed as magic and his evidence, what his evidence is for all of this. He goes around the world and he visits different archaeological sites and he claims to find evidence of depictions of aliens, depictions of alien technology, and he claims to find things like, you know, impossible constructions, rocks that were too big to lift or too big to carve or some sundry thing. Um, this, of course, is it's not the origins of ancient aliens, uh, but it is literally the origins of the TV show. The modern TV show Ancient Aliens was produced in homage to the works of Eric Von Doniken, and he has been occasionally an executive producer on the modern TV show shown on the History Channel. Now, there's some problems here. There's a few problems. There's quite a few problems here, really. I, remember, I am an archaeologist, but before we get to the archaeology part, let me just repeat. By the time Von Doniken publishes his book in 1968, Ancient Alien Contacts, that aliens are gods and their technology is magic, this is an outright trope in science fiction. Uh, there have been like dozens of authors who have actually written about this or, or used it as a ploy in their stories before we get to Eric Von Doniken. That's kind of weird, right? Uh, but Von Donneken says it's real. Von Donneken also wasn't the first person to say that it was real. Uh, there's actually several authors that wrote similar things in you know, 10 years and even you know, 50, 60 years earlier to Von Donneken, uh, but they never got as much attention as Von Donneken's books did. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Von Donneken was sued. After Chariots of the Gods came out, he was actually sued by some of these authors uh, claiming that they, he had plagiarized them. And this, that lawsuit was settled out of court. And, you know, who knows? We all know, you know, people sometimes settle out of court for you know, reasons that they just have to do it. It doesn't necessarily imply his guilt. But we do know that this lawsuit was brought. It was settled out of court. And subsequent editions of Chariots of the Gods had references to some of these earlier works all of a sudden. Nothing in his book was new. It was just popular in a way that none of these other books have been popular before. So that's kind of weird as a problem, right? I, as an archaeologist, also have some huge problems with this. There are some logical problems. There are some you know, major jumps. That, you know, the basic example of what's going on here is Von Donica takes everything out of context. Just find some random cave painting, some random piece of ancient art, and say, tells you, the reader, to look at it and say, oh my God, doesn't that look like a space alien UFO, something or another? And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I think it kind of looks like that, right? 
This on the screen in front of you is one of the classic examples. This on the far right, you see the carved image of Pakal's sarcophagus lid. Pakal was a ruler of the ancient Maya city of Palenque. And he was, this was the lid of his sarcophagus. It, this was a, he was actually buried underneath this image. It's a pretty complex image, right? If you look at that, there's a lot of lines, a lot of dots, a lot of things going on. This is a complex piece of iconography from a different culture that most of us aren't that familiar with. Uh, and Donakin's like, yeah, look at it. There's rocket flames coming out of the bottom. And see, he's sitting back in this chair and manipulating the controls of the flight deck with his hands. Like, sure, if you've never seen a piece of Maya art before, it kind of looks like that. I get that. But if you compare it to other pieces of Maya art, the elements in this image are extraordinarily common. And what you see in the center there that sort of the, makes up the core of the spaceship is a world tree. Uh, it is a very standard uh, Maya cosmic image of the world tree is what connects this world with the upper world and this world with the world beneath us. And what do you see? You see Pakal, the ruler, falling from this world into the underworld at the moment of his death. And yeah, this was like laying on top of his mortal remains. That's a pretty understandable interpretation of this piece of art too, by, you know, comparing it to other pieces of Maya art rather than just grabbing it, taking it totally out of context. Uh, my other favorite are the things like, you know, like those rocks, those rocks are so big, they couldn't have moved them. It must be some conspiracy. People can move really big rocks. They can. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It goes slow. But, you know, it, it can be done. One of my favorite examples, Stonehenge. Stonehenge, the modern heritage site, to go and visit it and see it today as a tourist. On the solstice, they occasionally invite people to the site to move a block. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2019, they invited a group of third graders uh, to come and move a multi-ton stone. And you know what they did? The third graders moved a giant stone, not one of the actual stones from Stonehenge, it's a replica stone, right? Or, a, a, or a, uh, an example stone. But a bunch of third graders could move one of those stones. It takes time, it takes organization. But people can do amazing things when they work together. So that leads me to my third problem, right? The first problem is like, this is an old story. It's been told a million times before. The second problem is that there's huge keep gaps or jumps and leaps of faith uh, in terms of archeological and scientific methodologies of taking things totally out of context, ignoring chronologies and all kinds of problems like that. But absolutely the most fundamental problem with von Donneken's claims that underlie the modern ancient aliens TV show, there's a fundamental sort of assumption that humans are kind of dumb and can't really do big complex things. And in particular, the vast majority of von Donneken's arguments or examples, I should say, came from places outside of Europe, non-Western cultures. The vast majority of his examples came from Central America, South America, Asia, Africa, places that had been colonized by Europe. And he only rarely and occasionally comes in, into Europe. There's a very fundamental thing here. Von Donneken is questioning whether people of color, indigenous people from around the world, could do these complex hard things. He almost never questions if European ancestors, ancestors could have done these complex things. Now that's subtle, and you've got to dig into this to see it, but it repeats itself over and over again. As von Donneken became successful and you know more popular and had sold more and more books, he didn't feel the need to be so subtle anymore. By the time you get to his 1979 book, Signs of the Gods, he flat out states his racial prejudices. When he says aliens, or asks, he always asks questions. It's just a question, I'm just asking. Did aliens separate Homo sapiens from the ape tribe and so leave a black race behind? He literally says that black people today are more like apes than people uh, than white people are. He also says, was the black race a failure? 
that the extraterrestrials changed the genetic code by gene surgery and created white and yellow races because they left the others behind. Von Donneken is pretty darn explicit when he is basically saying, you know, we don't really need to explain the accomplishments of white Europeans, but the accomplishments of people outside of Europe, those needed alien help because those people couldn't have done it on their own. Now, that's some pretty messed up stuff, right? Inherently suggesting that one group of people didn't need help and another group of people couldn't have built pyramids or other buildings without space alien help, right? <sighs> Ancient alien belief is inherently entangled with this kind of concept that some humans couldn't do things on their own. Now, Marvel sort of jumps into this pile. Uh, how does this all fit together? Marvel had been doing ancient alien lines long before uh, Von Donneken came around. And those ancient alien lines were still kind of problematic, but they weren't as overtly problematic uh, until now. But when Von Donneken sees so much success, Marvel jumps on the bandwagon. In 75, they publish Marvel Preview Presents number one, Man Gods from Beyond the Stars. This actually explicitly tells Marvel readers to go and check out Eric Von Donneken's work, along with a bunch of other paranormal and pseudoscientific work. Um, one year later, we get Jack Kirby's The Eternals, this inherent ancient alien story. Um, Kirby doesn't name Jack Von Donneken, but he does imply in his letter to the readers in here that this might be fact, this might be fiction, I don't know, we're kind of in the middle here somewhere, it could be one, it could be the either. They're happy to jump on this successful meme, this successful idea of ancient alien contact and sell more comic books from that process. A lot's changed since the 70s, and Marvel is very conscientious about the significance and the impact of their comics at this point. And this is, I guess, where I'm kind of probably like worried as an archaeologist with this new movie coming out with this new Eternals comic book series. It entrenches cosmology, right? It's not so much about what the storyline of the movie is or the storyline of the new comic book is. It entrenches the cosmology of celestials coming to Earth creating humans, not just Eternals and Deviants, that's, yeah, like that's the whole comic book fiction fun stuff, but it entrenches this idea that humans needed to be created by space aliens, and then in particular, you know, underneath that, that some humans might be better than other humans in this whole process, and that's pretty repugnant and problematic. But here's the kicker before I let you go, because whenever I go off on these things, we're like, it's just fiction, nobody cares, nobody watches the ancient alien TV show, they just laugh at it. Do they? Ancient Aliens still, it's kind of low for TV, but they still get like a million views an episode. A million people aren't going to watch me talk about this stuff. That's a lot of people. The other thing, the real kicker in the latest survey data that I have in 2018, 41% of Americans said Ancient Alien Contact was real. 41%, that's huge. That's almost half of America thinks that I and my entire profession has been lying to them, not just today, but for the past 150 years that my profession has existed in. Things like Eternals, I love this stuff. I'm a huge fanboy. I got all my D&D books down here. I got all my comic books down here. I'm a huge fanboy of this stuff. I'm not saying you can't play with these ideas and have fun with these ideas, but we have to be concerned and significant and understand what that baseline idea is. The baseline idea behind ancient alien contact is that white Europeans could have built anything. People elsewhere around the world, kind of problematic. Maybe couldn't do it on their own. Might have needed alien help. And that's a problematic sub-thread to a new Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. Thanks for tuning in. Great to see you all. Uh, come and follow me on the social medias. You can find me at DSA Archaeology on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and all those places. Stay tuned for the next episode and stay tuned for a Q&A. Great to talk to you all. All right, David. Thank you for a wonderful and yet somehow depressing talk. Uh, I'm going to unmute you right now. Um, Bring in the joy everywhere I can. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier after uh, after Blake and Bassett, I said, um, you know, we can enjoy these weird ideas. Um, I love watching Bigfoot shows and all that. 
But I'll tell you what, I can't get through five minutes of Ancient Aliens. I've tried. It's a problem. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'm, I, his name's not in front of me and I'm forgetting his name, but the gentleman who was talking about Rick and Morty and the science behind Rick and Morty, I mean, he was talking about, like, yeah, we, Matt can, we should, we want to use this pop culture to inspire people and to lead them to new and great things. But some of those great things are eugenics and racism, and that's kind of problematic. So we have to, you know, take that up front whenever we can. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I suppose everything from the past is going to be a little icky. I tell you what, though, uh, Stephanie had the question earlier, and it kind of relates to like that, that Von Daniken quote you put up about a failed race and all that. Oh, my God. I had never, you know, I've been steeped in this stuff for decades now. And I never came across that quote. Uh, that's pretty horrific. Um, but it brings up the question. I mean, somebody who just randomly turns on ancient aliens, you know, uh, just because there's nothing else on. Not that this is an excuse, but do you think that they realize just how racist he really was? I think a lot of people don't. And I think this is sort of hits at the, you know, the inherent difference between systemic racism and individual prejudice, right? It's like it's just because you watch the show, you aren't all of a sudden magically racist somehow. And you, you just because you didn't recognize or see the, the racism implicit in the concept doesn't mean that you're too dumb to see it or that you're somehow you know, un, unduly influenced yourself. It's just that it's, you know, when you see it over and over again, like, it, you know, you said he's rarely that explicit. You know, he got really explicit in that, this, you know, Signs of the Gods in 79, but he's rarely that explicit and the show's right. never that explicit. But if you look at the pattern over and over and over again, that is sort of the, the fundamental underbelly of all this stuff. Yeah, I have to assume because you said, I forget, you probably know, when did the Eternals debut? I assume it was before. 76. Yeah, so before that Von Daniken uh, kind of exposed him. <laughs> yeah, bef before that explicit version, but you know, he had <laughs> three books out by that. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Chariots of the Gods is 68, and he started, he had several books in the early 70s. I believe he had three, if not four books published uh, before uh, yeah, uh, the Eternals debuts. No, Jeb J. Card, who will be on our uh, conspiracy panel with James Tynan later, he, uh, I think, I mean, this has got to be a part of it. Do you know if Kirby was influenced by the Shaver mysteries at all? Because the Deviants really yeah. into that. Yeah, yeah. So I saw Jeb bringing that stuff up. Um, Maybe Jeb knows specifically. I don't know specifically. I, it, there's an obvious, clear echo um, in Kirby's work with the Eternals to Richard Shaver's uh, stories for Amazing Stories, uh, with these you know, secret underworld demons uh, sort of plaguing the world. I, I've been asking this question in general for not just the Eternals, but for a lot of Kirby's work, because Kirby brings in a lot of pseudoscience, a lot of paranormal stuff. Uh, you know, where did what was he specifically uh, inspired by? Um, I, I, I've only, I've read a couple of, of bios of Kirby. It doesn't seem like there's a ton published about him. And my impression, especially from the 1960s, is that he was just churning stuff out so oh, yeah. fast that I kind of think, you know, my impression of artists working in those kind of conditions, I'm not sure they're conscious of what they're being <laughs> inspired by at that point either. For sure. But clearly, For sure. clearly Kirby is picking up on paranormal literature and other, you know, a pulp fiction and other comic books and running with it. And so, I, you know, I think there's almost certainly a direct connection back to Richard Shaver. I don't know uh, if it's been specifically like point by point tied back to him. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, go ahead and post in the chat. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I listened to a podcast called Marvel by the Month. Uh, it literally looks at all the Marvel comics that came out in whatever month, starting all the way at the beginning with Fantastic Four, number one. And yeah, I mean, like in those first couple of years, it was a two man show. It was Lee and Kirby and Kirby was oh. drawing like 50, 60 pages a, a month, which is impossible by today's uh, detail yeah. standards. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, he was a workaholic. He had debts to pay off. He had kids to feed. So yeah, it all, just like with all of us, I'm sure it all jumbled up in his head and, and then spilled onto the page. Yeah. You know, I think there were some questions early on. There's the, you know, Rob's question about Loki and there was some yeah. question about the Theosophical Society. And uh, I know, um, you know, for those of you who are not uh, familiar, one of the great books out there that you can pick up is Jason Colavito's H.P. Lovecraft and the Cult of Alien Gods. If you want to know more about ancient alien ideas and claims and histories and where it all came from, 
Uh, and Colavito lays out a pretty great sort of transmission chain from this esoteric spiritual group, uh, the Theosophical Society that got started back in the late 19th century in upstate New York. Um, and the Theosophical Society and uh, Helena Vavatsky was one of the founding authors and influencers and in some of her writings really get into this idea of early human history being influenced by spirits from beyond this realm or beyond this world. And, you know, it's, it's very reminiscent and there is a direct chain of transmission to sort of modern ancient alien claims, although hers were, I think she was far more just straight up spiritual about this, not necessarily like actual alien spaceships coming down uh, to the world in this whole process. And, you know, the, the original question someone asked was whether uh, people today are aware of, you know, how much ancient aliens is inspired by theosophical society uh, beliefs and it was funny because i've been to the theosophical society i went for like a week-long retreat uh, a couple of years ago uh, and sort of tried to blend in and go to all the talks and whatnot i i, I don't think a lot of people know who the theosophical society is it's you know unless i'm talking to a group like you all who are deep in the skeptical world where there's a lot of uh, discussion of these issues I haven't met a lot of people who know who the, the society is. And so I think in general, no, people don't know that these you know, ideas are influenced by that. But the, the Theosophical Society also seemed to have, like people I spoke to at the society didn't have much you know, thought or uh, awareness that there might be some connection between Blavatsky's writings and uh, modern alien beliefs sort of in the same way. And so I think you know, a lot of that connection has, you know, it's there, it's real, uh, but you know, it's, it's so sort of long and drawn out that I'm not sure many people are aware of it at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's interesting to think about, and it'll be really interesting to see how the Eternals movie plays out. Um, I guess, like you said, I mean, uh, Marvel and especially now Disney is conscientious about these things, so um, it'll be interesting to see how they how they play it. Yeah, yeah. I've been. This is you know. I apologize for depressing everybody and bringing the room <laughs> down, but it's just like every time I see a new advertisement for the movie, I'm like, I, like I, it's I, it's probably gonna be okay. I hope so they thought about these issues. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, David. We appreciate it. Thank you, Russ. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sticking around. Where else can we find your stuff? Uh, you can find me uh, on all the social medias at DSA Archaeology, and I can lead you from there. Terrific. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.